Hello and welcome. You've got the wrong man. You often hear prisoners say it, but in the case of Guantanamo, it turns out they may be right. The Bush administration called the detainees at Gitmo, as it's nicknamed, the worst of the worst. In most cases, that turned out to be very wrong, according to an in-depth investigation by the respected American media service, McClatchy. Find an answer. We set out to interview as many former detainees as possible. Traveling to cafes in Germany, a refugee center in Albania, a mosque in Jordan, the narrow side streets of Karachi, and the dusty and at times dangerous cities and hamlets of Afghanistan. The men were often difficult to find, and even after we sat down with them, were hesitant to talk because of worries of retribution from their government or militants. We looked through thousands of pages of unclassified U.S. military tribunal transcripts from Guantanamo and military court-martial documents. We spoke with a large number of former Bush administration and defense officials in Washington and elsewhere. The picture that emerged was complex. Many of the detainees, particularly those from Afghanistan, had no connection with international terrorism or any groups that pose a threat to the security of the United States. Well, those stories from Guantanamo certainly are very complicated, and we'll examine some of them as we continue the second day of our look at the controversial detention facility. On this show, we ask, who are the Guantanamo detainees and why has America been so slow to admit that it made mistakes? Don't forget, we take your calls on this show and you can reach us at the numbers at the bottom of your screen. Well, joining us from Pittsburgh to discuss this is Matthew Schofield, who's the deputy national editor at the Kansas City Star. Previously, he was McClatchy's European bureau chief and interviewed several of the detainees featured in the investigation. Here in Washington, I'm joined by Roy Gutman, McClatchy's, McClatchy's uh, foreign editor who oversaw this series. And I want to welcome both of you to the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. Pleasure. Roy, I, if I could ask you, first of all, what prompted this investigation? What made you want to hear the stories of the detainees of Guantanamo? Well, you could see, uh, this really started a year and a year and a half ago, that the administration was probably going to release um, most of the people from Guantanamo within a period of time. Uh, they had already, right now, they've released 500 of the 770 held. And it just seemed to me that uh, their stories uh, were what we were missing. Uh, a lot of people tried to reconstruct what happened to people uh, while they were at Guantanamo. There were at least a, dozen, a few dozen uh, accounts. But nobody tried actually to go after the individuals and just uh, and get the big picture. So we, we decided at McClatchy we would go <laughs> and try to Major do that. Major undertaking. I know you, you said it took up most of your year of your life, you're telling me just before. Uh, <laughs> and the last five months, <laughs> uh, every day and night, and practically. Well, let me ask you, there was <coughs> a, um, it's interesting that your investigation revealed a lack of worthwhile intelligence that was gained from those held. And a quote from the U.S. intelligence officer that you, you have in your investigation is very interesting. Uh, the quote says, or the officer says, as far as intelligence value for, uh, from those in Gitmo, I got tired of telling the people writing reports based on their interrogations that the material was essentially worthless. So why has America taken so long to admit that there have been so many failures with uh, Guantanamo Bay? I mean, the problem of Guantanamo begins with the fact the Bush administration decided to throw away the law, both uh, international law, the laws of war, uh, and also domestic law. So they never had a process in place so that they could differentiate between uh, people who might be a, a threat or might have intelligence value and those who had uh, neither. Well, let me get in Matthew Schofield here because you conducted many of the, uh, the interviews uh, that, you, that you did uh, for, the, for the investigation. What, what, what basically changed, what, how did it change your perceptions of what Guantanamo was about? I don't know that it particularly changed the perception. I was a bit surprised at how little involved um, the, the guys I was talking to had to do with anything involving the United States at all. Um, these were men who, uh, in almost every case, were extremely poor, um, were just looking to travel to a better life, and ended up in U.S. captivity. Um, and and, and the, the phrases they kept repeating themselves were, we were told repeatedly, you listen, we don't really have anything against you. You'll be released soon. And this would begin six months after captivity and would continue for up to five years. What was the hardest thing, uh, Matthew? What was the hardest thing about the investigation? I think one of the one of the more difficult things about the investigation was was convincing people who had been so poorly treated um, by the U.S. government to trust an American news organization, to believe that we actually were willing to tell their stories, that we were willing to devote time to each and every one of their tales. These are people who had severe trust issues at this point, um, people who were taken out of everyday normal lives and, and thrust into an extraordinary 
situation um, and, and very little trust coming out of this. I want to get an email uh, a question to you please Matthew. This came in from Australia and uh, mm -hmm. S. Anoma writing in from Sydney in Australia said after interviewing many detainees have you found the purpose behind the administration's extreme actions which have had long reaching repercussions on the freedom of uh, people world over? Um, I, mean, I, I think the the reason behind it is fairly simple. It's something we all know. It was this this, uh, this intense fear of um, you know the, the the war on terror. It was this intense fear of terrorism. Uh, sadly, the the way they went about this was to grab pretty much anyone they could find. I mean, it, there was there was very little. There was a very low bar of evidence for arresting these people. It was substantially lower than any criminal. Um, situation we'd accept here in the United States. Right. People were grabbed off the streets. They were grabbed because someone who had seen someone for the first time said, this is a terrorist, so grabbed them. Um, it's a disturbing practice. So no, in the end, no, I don't understand why these people were taken. We're going to ask, uh, we're going to ask you to describe some of those stories in a moment, but let's get a caller in from Afghanistan. Ahmed's on the line. Ahmed, what would you like to ask? Uh, I want to ask from the gentleman in D.C. that you don't think Americans, by putting Afghans and Iraqis in a jail like Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib, they are costing themselves more problems. These people are related in these countries, in a tribe, in a family, number right. of families. Everyone will stay against them, and they will make their life hell in Afghanistan and also the poor Afghans by p doing a mistake, putting someone in the right. jail. Actually, Ahmed, that's an interesting yeah. point, and, and, and Roy, if I could put this to you as well, that one of the things that, that came out is that, as, as Matthew has indicated in the investigation, a lot of these people had nothing to do with terrorism, but then they were sort of brought together with some of, some of the, the sort of the worst of the worst, as the, the U.S. called them, and, and essentially it becomes a recruiting ground in Guantanamo for people who've become disillusioned with the way they've been treated. Well, it seems to me that, in fact, there's been a total backfire here in terms of the, the aims of setting up this detention center. Look, you know, the, the Ahmed's point is a, is a good one. We're all troubled by this as America, I mean, any American who knows anything about this would be <laughs> deeply troubled by it. It isn't because the tribes are connected, though, Ahmed. It's because no single person should be jailed without cause. No so single person should be jailed, jailed without due process. We have to care about every single individual. And uh, clearly, when we don't do it, we set a terrible example for the rest of the world. And before I get to our caller in <coughs> London, let me just uh, get one of the clips from your uh, from your interviews, uh, where you, you talked with a, with a uh, member who fought with the Taliban. His name is Amir Jan Gorzang. And uh, he actually was on the right side initially and then was taken in. Let's just listen to this. بیانو <laughs> Matthew, I'll get on to you, uh, get to you with the, the issue of vendettas that often ended up uh, putting people into Guantanamo in just a moment. But let's get on the line from London, uh, Anwar, who has a question. Anwar, go ahead. Hello, hello, Reza. Um, good evening to the gentlemen. Uh, my question is very simple, Reza. Why the Guantanamo Bay prisoners and their inquiry and their cases are not put in front of the whole world? International Court of Justice, why is it not open if America says that what it is true what they say then why not let a public inquiry into each prisoner and let the world know what the reality is and okay. who is making Anwar, money uh, uh, before i get to matthew let's roy you wanted to chip you in know on this. i th i think you've got a good point uh i don't know what court or what instance it should be in i think in the first instance the americans should investigate themselves through the u.s congress uh through some maybe non-governmental organizations human rights organizations we wanted to make a start on that very point. We wanted to sort of uh, give the kind of the big picture as best as we could assemble it uh, and then hope that that would be provide a roadmap for somebody to follow. We could only do 66. 
there's 500 people out there altogether, mm -hmm. and one day there may be a lot more than that. So uh, clearly we need to get the facts first, and then we can see what you do about it. All right. Matthew, <coughs> we, we heard earlier on uh, Amir uh, Jango Zhang talking about how it was essentially a vendetta that put him behind uh, bars in Guantanamo in Afghanistan. He was originally fighting the Taliban. Tell me about some of those stories like his that you came across. Well, the stories like his, I, did, I didn't talk to him. That was Tom Laster, right. who was really the lead reporter on this um, story. But the stories I came across that were similar to this were, were people would find themselves in a situation where an official didn't like them. So there were, the, the word is that the United States was offering $3,000, $5,000 for every terrorist you could turn over. If they, were, if they had al-Qaeda, it was $3,000 if it was just a, a regular um, Taliban member um, who had some kind of anti-U.S. feelings. It was $5,000 if they had al-Qaeda connections, these sorts of things. Um, and, and at least the stories we were getting is that this was happening repeatedly again and again. Um, Pakistani military, um, the, the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, they were handing people over left and right looking for money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this was an easy way to make money. Anyone they didn't like in particular it was an easy way to get rid of them quickly. The U.S. was very indiscriminate in who they were taking. They weren't looking for any particular amount of evidence to hold them. And once they had them in, in control, they weren't even asking much out of them. All right, we're going to take a very short break here, gentlemen. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more on this discussion and your questions in a moment.